All right, thank you everybody for coming, especially the Mets fan, Queens in the house, what's up? <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna take a little journey through sports and graphic novels for sports fans and non-sports fans alike. Um, I want to start by asking, both of your stories feature young girls uh, who face significant challenges in sports environments that aren't traditionally welcoming to them. Um, so why don't you start off with what were your inspiration for these two, um, I don't want to say disenfranchised, but these two groups of ladies that faced the challenges that they did. That's good. You want to, you want me to start? Sure. I mean, I, 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 I put a female protagonist in my book because my son hasn't read any of my books. So I, no, I'm just kidding. Know your audience. That's, I don't see anyone writing anything down. Know your my audience. Two daughters, my two daughters have both read my books. My son hasn't, so there you go. No, um, it, it, for, for me, it wasn't really specifically like I want to write a book with a female protagonist. It's just sort of like that's, she just came to me that way. You know, she was always Elena mm -hmm. Rueda, and, and I kind of just run with that and then try to ask the questions. It's okay, so why? Is she playing baseball? Like, what you know? What are the challenges she's facing? And then, as as the story, as I kind of develop the story, I start answering those questions um, that I'm asking. And and I think that um, when you start researching, especially in baseball, like there is there's a there's a large population of of young girls that are that play baseball, not not necessarily softball, and they kind of like get um, they they kind of get pushed out at around 13 or 14. Um, and they're encouraged to play softball, right? And a lot of them kind of just give up altogether because they, it's a very different game. Um, and, and so I just kind of wanted to lean into that idea of like, what is it when this kid is like, she's a superstar, you know, she's like the superstar of her league, of her team, and now she's facing this sort of pressure from her mother to break that ceiling, like go make it. And so this is kind of like where it sort of manifested. Yeah. Um, for me, my story is based on a real life story of a team that I learned about the Salam School Girls basketball team in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it was an educator at a conference who shared an article with me about this team. And you know, it was fascinating. There was an all hijab wearing girls team, something I'd never seen before. And this remarkable turnaround season that didn't end exactly the way you would expect, but still had all the ingredients of a great come, comeback story. Um, and so I started researching a bit more about the actual team and everything I could. They, they had been covered locally in Milwaukee, but also nationally on CNN and Washington Post actually did a feature on them. And they had a bleacher report done. So oh, there was video. Sorry. Yeah, it was really cool. And the more I... I read about these girls and watched their story, I wanted to tell it because it was, it was just so captivating and so inspiring, but I also wanted to dig behind the scenes and what wasn't being asked, and, and you know, we can talk about that more later, but a way to bring the story, the, their actual story to life, but you know, in a fictional way, but also dig a little deeper than what I was reading. Yeah, yeah I think at the heart of both of these stories is um, teamwork, right? Teamwork's a very crucial part of the narrative. So um, how did you approach writing these relationships and, and what are you hoping the takeaway is um, from the teamwork aspect of each of your novels? I mean, like, r r raise your hand if you ever played a sport before. Okay, so just a few of you. Um, the, the, okay, raise your hand if you've ever felt pressure when you play a sport. So like, my, my dad, my dad, just for context, my dad is in the Cuban Baseball Hall of Fame. My dad was recruited by the Cleveland Indians. Okay, my dad was, uh, he, he played on the Olympic national team uh, basketball. And my dad was my coach. Um, I don't know if any of your parents were your coaches when you were growing up, but there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of pressure. They cast a big shadow and you want to constantly feel like you're proving um, yourself to them. And this, a, a big portion of this book is about reconnecting with yourself and learning to love to play on your own terms. My dad never pressured me, but I pressured myself at what I thought my dad wanted. He wanted me, so when I would you know, miss a ground ball and I'd get scored on, or I, I would miss a free throw or anything like that, I always felt it like, oh, dad's upset with me. But it was never about that. And I had a conversation with my abuelo one time after I had missed a ground ball and the team scored the, the winning run and I lost the game and I was really bummed. And my abuela goes, you, you don't look like you're having fun anymore. 
And I was like, I just don't, I think he's gonna be upset. He's not gonna be proud of me. And my dad overheard this conversation. My dad said, I never wanted you to play for me. I wanted you to play for you. And if you don't want to play, that's okay. But you have to learn to love to play. Whatever it is you choose. And this is really what the, like what I channeled when I was working on this. Mm. It's like to learn to love to play on your own terms. And, and, and kind of retreat from the necessity to, to um, do it for someone. Yeah, I, I feel like my, my character has a little bit of that too. My, my lead character, Aaliyah, puts a lot of pressure on herself too to succeed um, and focuses a lot on her mistakes like many of us do. We don't always remember the good that we do, but we remember when we mess up. Um, and that's a lesson she has to learn. But for me, the, the whole concept of a team, you know, there's so, so many things to benefit from being on a team, like an instant sense of community or, or even almost like a family, uh, especially for someone like my character who's new to a, a school in a year that's already started. So that's already difficult. Um, but then also just the, you know, going through a season together and all the ups and downs and, and growing and evolving as, as a group in addition to yourself. Um, and of course, with, with a great coach uh, or coaches, that can also you know, take you to a new level. Um, but the logo, the theme, I should say, of the story is, is more than a score. And that's really what you know, we were work what the actual team I interviewed uh, and the coach I had interviewed uh, were talking about and what I really wanted the message to be too. And I think sometimes when it's team sports, it is about wins and losses, but really it's more than that. Yeah, and I think the common thread between both these stories is the main character has a lot of outside pressures on them almost at all times, right? Sometimes it's the parent, sometimes it's the media, right? And you know, you see this in both of the, the stories where the pressure can be intense. Like I felt like the pressure for these young people was really intense considering their playing a sport which essentially should be for fun, right? They're not, like, they're not necessarily being professional athletes or, or going down that path, even if they have the skill to do so. So can you talk about how you navigated that portion of it? Because for me, especially as a parent, like, I feel like that pressure, there was a lot of external pressure throughout almost the whole book in each one of your books. The, like, the, the, the pressure that the kid received? Has. Yeah, the kid, like, for, in your instance, it was the mom, right? Like, pushing the kid yeah. to, to play baseball at, at a very high level, not even, like, recreationally. And then I would say even so, there was some pressure, like, when they were LARPing, right? When they were kind of acting out in, in the dragon things of, of being a part of something that was uncomfortable for her. Yeah, I mean, it's also, like, when you're highly competitive, I mean, have you ever, you're either... You either are that person or you know someone that is that person who's like super ultra competitive in everything. Like I refuse to play any card games with my mother-in-law because she's the worst at, I love my mother-in-law, but she is so competitive, right? My brother-in-law's in the audience here and he knows this, so he's laughing, he knows the story. He's, the last time we were playing cards, right? She, you know, my, my brother-in-law David is like, I'm not playing. <laughs> So, because Cindy was, and so this, this idea of like this ultra competitive, and when Elena was the main character, when she is forced out of playing and now is put into the field to go LARPing, live action role playing with her brother and their kind of like ragtag group of friends, she, that, that competitiveness like kicks in. It's, it's really hard to like remove her. She's not having fun. She's not having fun. She's not playing, right? She's stopped having fun. And that, it, that extends to her time on the field, right? She's not having fun anymore, right? And so in every instance, it's really not about like, oh, it doesn't matter if you lose, right? But it doesn't all have to be about winning. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying, I was trying to convey with, with her character is like to learn this journey of like, it's not always about winning, right? You right. can just have fun. So if your mother-in-law is listening, <laughs> it's okay to just have fun playing a Cindy, board game. listen, Cindy. Cindy, we're trying to help you, Cindy, you wherever know, you are. It's just cards. <laughs> it's just cards. Yeah. I no, I love and that. Farkle. And I love how you're... <laughs> Farkle. Oh, my God. It's the word. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. who hasn't flipped a board up during Scrabble when someone scores a seven-word, seven-letter score on you? Raise your hand. See, everyone has. Yeah. You're in a safe space, Bob. <laughs> I loved it when Elena, your character 
tries to make everything competitive. Right, that that LARPing. Cute. Yeah, yeah, it's something that's meant to be fun. But yeah, for, for me, the pressure, you know, for me, whenever I write a book, I always want people of any background, you know, whether you're an athlete or not, or understand that, the pressure of, of playing, uh, for it to be relatable. So, so my character, you know, she has a lot of, like you said, external pressure, um, the pressure she puts on herself to do well, you know, academic versus, you know, the team's pressure. Um, and then this unexpected media attention where suddenly she's being interviewed by journalists who are asking questions that she doesn't know how to answer. And suddenly she's, you know, becoming this representative of her faith because she wears the hijab or being asked about things that, you know, and the whole team really is being asked about things that they don't necessarily really want to talk about. They, they want to talk about basketball and they want to be seen as any other athlete. Um, so that was an interesting, component to the story in terms of how you navigate a multitude of pressures and and what do you do when it becomes too much <laughs> yeah. yeah you know speaking of pressure both of these authors kind of had to go out of their comfort zone into the graphic novel right this is the first graphic novel that you're doing um, both of those, right you. if you're if you're writing you have just the words on the page and now the graphic novel adds an extra layer of visual right and so I, I want both of them to talk about the process of working with an illustrator for the first time, having this idea for a book, but now you have to work with someone that is trying to visually represent what it is that you're trying to get on the page. And I think Pablo brought some slides. Henna did not, not because she doesn't like anybody. She's just not a slide person, but you know, it's okay. Um, but you have a slide here, which I think this works. Um, so this is the manuscript page, right? So this is the page that Pablo worked from, and then walk us through how this translates to what we see on the, the actual page. Uh, so I, I have to preface this with saying I had a panic attack when um, I was asked to write this graphic novel. And the reason why, so Disney, Disney approached me to write um, originally, it was a remix of The Sandlot. Does anybody remember The Sandlot? So I, like, my agent called me and said, are you sitting down? And I was like, yes. And actually, Cindy was there when this happened. Um, I don't want to get her mad. And, and, she, and, and my agent says, well, Disney wants you to, they want you to remix uh, uh, The Sandlot. And I, and I had her on speaker, and Cindy's like, oh my god, I'm going to be in it. I'm going to be in it. This is Cindy. This is what I'm like, Cindy, stop. And so when I did this, I, I wrote a script. I wrote a script. Okay. And then I turned it in, and they were like, well, no, we, we actually, we're not going to do the script. We want you to write a book. So I, I was like, okay. So I turned it, I started writing the book. And then I hear some silence. And then they say, okay, so we don't, um, we, we don't actually want to do the Sandlot anymore, but we really like your idea. So let's just scrap all of that. And what we really want you to do is a graphic novel. What? <laughs> I had never written a graphic novel in my life. So it's not like, I want to write a graphic novel. No, I'm terrified of the idea of writing a graphic novel. And so when I end up like saying yes, because I don't know. Um, it's Disney. Yeah, it's Disney. And right? Cindy's watching. It's like the mouse. And Cindy's watching. <laughs> and I have to like, you know, like. And so anyway, so I go and. I start researching on how to do it. And this page is um, a reflection of what the writer, what I learned the writer does. Now, I don't know if, Hannah, if yours is different, if your process was different with this, but um, was Cindy at your call? <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, was more, it was more of like, it's a very, um, it's a process that is almost like your, your storyboarding. If you're thinking about storyboarding. So if you look up, um, if you look behind, just the, you're basically, um, if you can go back, go back. Oh, back? There's yeah. no back button. Oh, okay, well, and it, so, uh, go one more up. Okay, so if you see like page two, panel one, you see that, and then, it's, and then it says Elena bolts, the, pitch, uh, the pitcher has launched the ball to home plate. Those are all directions that I'm giving the illustrator, and it's each page is a manuscript page on the book. And so you're really trying to give as many details as possible and trying to think about like, okay, where are the beats of the story? Like when the reader turns the page, where are the, are the illustrations? You can't, and so I really, but also trying to respect the fact that the illustrators has to imagine their own version or vision for the story. 
And so that's kind of, it's a really interesting dance. Um, and it, and it, it's a really great way to write with a team, you know? Um, and so it was kind of cool. And having like, having the, to imagine what I hope the panels look like, and then Miguel doing the beautiful job of like bringing those panels to life. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I did set out to do a graphic novel. Um, I had not done it before, except for with DC Comics. I was invited to do a talent development workshop with them back in 2016 cool. with Scott Snyder, who writes Batman. So it was, it was really cool. Um, I was the only person in the class who had zero comic writing experience. I did not know that before I started. So it was a steep learning curve for me, but it was how I learned to appreciate the format and how to think in frames and and also to realize that you, you, know, you can think like a movie without a budget. That's what they kept telling me, that you have no budget. <laughs> and so my characters, my superhero characters, since this was superhero comic writing, like to sit around and talk about their feelings. And they would say, okay, but you know, how about some more fighting and explosions? And so I'd go back to my manuscript and try to add in more fighting and explosions. But I realized that I loved the format, even if I wasn't destined to be a comic book, right? A superhero comic writer. Um, but when I, when I read about and watched the story of these girls and the Salam School team, um, the imagery of this, you know, this team of all hijab wearing girls was something I had never seen. And the few times I saw hijab wearing athletes, it was usually a solo sport, like mm. a fencer or a, a track, track runner. Um, a surfer too. I so think. yes, a surfer, but I'd never seen a team of girls and that was just so visually arresting and, and, the, and then also the diversity on the team, things like that that I thought were so important. And the, what I also love about comic format is that you can, you can tell a lot of story in a short space. And so I didn't have to describe basketball I could just show key moments. Mm. And even if you're not big into basketball, you get the point, you know, and you see the scoreboard and you, you can follow what's happening. So it gives you a lot of leeway and you're still, like you said, pulling out those key moments and building emotion and um, developing your characters, but in a very different way. And, and for me, it was just magical to see uh, Sophia's art, you know, bring my imaginings to life. And yeah, it's beautiful. And compared to picture book writing, which I had done previously, where you give minimal art notes and really let them shine, um, in this case, you're, you know, you're being very specific and then yeah. seeing the way they interpret that. I found it interesting, too. But, um, when, did they ever ask you, like, OK, so what exact skin color do you want your characters to have? Um, not specifically, but I did, in the individual character descriptions, I would say, you know, this person is. Um, maybe ethnically Iranian, and this person is African American, or this, you know. So I did describe that, gotcha, um, okay. and then the artist interpreted that as she did. Okay. Yeah. One thing I did ask for is, on the cover, it's hard to tell from back there, but the girls are wearing different hijab colors, and in the original art, the and in, in real life, the team has a uniform, so they all wear matching hijabs, either you know black or white or whatever it is. And I found throughout the book that sometimes it was hard to tell some of the players apart. And so I said, could we give each girl a signature oh. hijab color that she wears throughout the book, um, whether it's her school uniform or her team uniform. And so we ended up changing it to make it a little easier. It is interesting too when you, when you talk about like, did, did you have any challenges with like the, 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 the mechanics of the sport with the illustrator? Um, a little bit. So Sophia had played basketball in middle school, okay. so she was very good overall at understanding the sport and what was happening. My husband, who's sitting in the audience, was great at correcting form. So he's uh. like, no, nah, that's not how you would do a layup. <laughs> or why are all these shooters left-handed? Which I was like, I didn't know. I'm a lefty, so I thought it was cool. And actually, I really didn't notice. But, but he, he picked, pointed that out, and so that was great to have. And yeah. it is worth their weight in gold, just so everyone, <laughs> everyone knows, right? Um, all right, so we have a, a, some more time. We're definitely going to leave time for questions. So if you have questions that you want, feel free to step up to one of the mics. Um, like they said, for, um, for any age, we can raise or lower the mics. Um, one question I had was, because it's such a, the girls in these books don't have a lot of representation in much media. So what has the feedback been for you 
for girls to see people like them, like living on the page, right? It's not just reading about them in the book. It's not just limited to a color where a cover. They can actually relate to the characters in the book. What feedback have you gotten on that front? Uh, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I like... I like just stories to be about the story, right? I mean, it's like, it's not a, it's not a girl book. It's a okay. book about an athlete, you know, who happens to be a girl. Like, it's, like I, I wish that we could just enjoy stories for what they are, right? Instead of like, well, this is a book that really celebrates girls trying to break that glass. No, it's, she's, she's just a really gifted athlete, you know? Um, and is like her, her so what, what I have, the feedback that I've gotten is, I, had a, I got a, a beautiful note from, from a kid who, who said, um, I don't play baseball, but, I, but, I'm an, but uh, she said, but I'm an actor, and I totally get the pressure that Elena was going through, right? Okay, you know, she, she didn't say, oh, I'm so glad that she's a girl, you know what I mean? Like, it's like she gets the pressure, and that's the, that's the goal that, that I hope, that we're looking at stories for stories, that you're looking at, it's, yes, it's a very specific, type of story that you've written, right? But it's really about the pressure that comes when the, when the spotlight is on you. And how do you manage that, right? And that pressure of like, okay, do I have to be the representation of this entire culture, this right. entire, you know what I mean? And the answer is no, right? right. <laughs> and I think for me personally, that also extended to myself and, and starting out in this industry 20 years ago and being one of the first mainstream published Muslim American authors and feeling that pressure to have to represent everyone. And I felt like the, the same kind of pressure was put on these girls where it's like, you know, they're, they're in high school and, and they, they don't need that, but they got it. Um, but they managed it really well and, um, and had each other to support each other and lean on. And in terms of feedback, I mean, I think it goes both ways. It's, it's amazing to hear people who are completely different from your protagonist, tell you that they connected to the story and why, like you said. And it also, to me personally, does mean a lot when, when kids who haven't seen themselves and who have been left out of the narrative for so long tell me how much it means to them or how they connect. Um, and specifically, this book just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, the coach of the team who I interviewed wrote me a beautiful email just last week um, saying how how much she loved the story. And that was pressure I felt, you know, like it, even though it's fictional, a lot of it came from this actual team. And, and she said it reminded her of why she had so much fun, you know, co coaching that team, especially this specific season. And, and she's a non-Muslim woman who came into this Islamic school. And, and that's part of the book as well, is her, you know, learning about them and them learning about her and all of that. So, so that was really validating to hear. Oh, we've got a couple of questions. We'll start here on my right. Um, oh. <laughs> Both of you are accomplished novelists before you went into the graphic novel form. And one of my favorite parts of middle grade novels is the development of voice, the novels that have really strong voice. And I was wondering if you could talk about the difference in developing voice in a graphic novel form versus a traditional novel. It's oh. a great question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, it's, it's just thinking about the visuals, right? You're, it's, you're, you're kind of, when you're, at least for me, when, you, when, I'm, when I'm writing, I'm, I'm accounting, to, I'm answering to myself, basically, well, and my editor, but, and Cindy. But, um, the, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm with, with the illustration, you're, you're keeping in mind that there is another artist at play, and you have to kind of respect what they're going to come to the table with. Yeah, I, I think for me, a lot of it was, um, making space for the art for sure. And there were times where I was tempted to add a caption, like a thought, a thought caption, that internal monologue that my character's having. And, and my editor actually said, well, we can just let her expression show that instead of calling back to this particular emotion, for example. Um, I think for me, the, the, the exciting challenge was establishing voice through dialogue. And that was something that I really struggled with in my first novel. Um, and actually had a friend who was a screenwriter go through with me and we would read the lines and I'd realize how stilted and awful my dialogue was. Um, and so for me, it was, it's just a nice step in my own evolution as a writer now to write something that's so heavily based on dialogue in terms of establishing mm. the character and who they are and, and their voice. I love that question. You're up, Shay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
I feel like sports stories are a very cool genre on their own. Do you have uh, particular sports books or movies that resonated with you guys? Oh, cool Runnings. <laughs> that was a favorite. Um, Sandlot. Sandlot was one. Was a great one. Yeah. Uh, what else? I loved Hoop Dreams. Uh, but who's who's the, the author that wrote uh, Born to Run? Uh, McDougal. Um, Chris uh, Christopher McDougal. Yeah. That book is awesome. It's like about the super marathon runners. Like, I mean, you know, sports is sports can be very inspiring. I mean, we just watched the Olympics. And I was like crying every night <laughs> at like these random sports I've never seen. I'm like, oh my God, the pole vaulter, you know, like, or like, oh, the shuffle border or whatever it is, you know, like, oh my God, what a beautiful story. Like, what a, you know, and it's just nice. Like sports, uh, sports gives us this sort of universal connection um, to, to like root for something, to achieve, to, to aim to achieve something. It's like, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and for me, just being in a, a sports-obsessed family, <laughs> and um, I feel like it gives me a little cred with my kids, and hopefully my husband too, to, to at least try. My, my question is, what's your basketball team? <laughs> uh, the Wizards. Wizards, go Wizards! <laughs> All right, so, well, I'm in Miami Heat, so I don't know. <laughs> I think my son is deflected. To, he just bought a Heat jersey. Yes! <laughs> See, the one that just went to college? Yeah. You're a Heat fan too? No, I'm a Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. You do you, well, yeah. But all right. Like, before this gets any century. more awkward, um, <laughs> all right. We we have another question right here. Uh, thank you for this um, great discussion. Now, who's your basketball team? That's what. We're <laughs> uh, Celtics. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks for your question. Okay. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> no. Go ahead. You got about a minute. Okay. Um, the interplay with the illustrator is really interesting to me. <laughs> Um, was there ever a point where the illustrator came back with an image that changed how you saw the story or changed how the story would have gone? And, and if that is the case, did it lead to changes in the story itself? It, that's a great question. For me, just very quick answer is not story-wise, but there were moments where like the, like, the kid, like the kid is throwing with her right hand and then the next panel, the glove is in her right hand. And so it's like to spot like the, the intricacies of like, wait, no, he, that's not, that's not good. So that was more those changes, but I think that we really gelled, like we got the story. And so that, that was something that I really appreciated because we just like vibed on the story. Some of the shirt colors or the, the, the way that they presented that stuff that was like his interpretation, which I think is cool. Yeah, I think for me, there weren't any big surprises, but what I did appreciate was the way um, Sophia even interpreted the, what a panel was. Yeah, so yeah. if I maybe had two panels on a page, it might be a full spread with a, one small box or something like that. Um, or making the, the panels horizontal, like uh, not diagonal, like instead mm -hmm. of straight to sort of add that fluidity and that those action Extra lines. too. Yeah, it's like, yeah so yeah. that part was really cool, just the way they interpreted action or, um, I saw that in your story too with like the, the full color imagination spreads. Like yeah, it's, yeah. It's really neat to see the way they interpret. Oh, Iris is, gonna, kind of Iris is gonna hook us off yeah, the stage. Yeah, we're about right? to wrap it up. So I um, wanna thank both of our authors here today for being here, but thank you, I'm Neil, for Pablo and Hannah. Thank you for showing up and enjoy the rest of the book fair. Thank you.